So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ronan Keane. I'm the Chair of Engineers Ireland Cork Region, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture on the history and rehabilitation of the Daly's Bridge, uh, known to sort of all of us locally as the Shaky Bridge. Um, I'm delighted to be co-hosting this uh, lecture with our colleagues from the Institute of Structural Engineers. Um, it's also a very timely lecture as it coincides with the 80th anniversary of the Cork region. Um, and our first chair was S.W. Farrington, uh, who was actually the city engineer when the bridge was built back in 1927. So uh, we have two excellent speakers this evening, um, Kieran McCarthy, who is going to go through the history of the bridge, and Michael Minehan, who uh, was involved directly with the refurb recent refurbishment of the bridge. So I'm going to hand you over now to Paul Sexton, who's the chair of the Institute of Structural Engineers Ireland branch, uh, and Paul is going to introduce our speakers properly. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, thank you, Ronan. Um, I just say for me, this project has everything. It's got history, culture, and a beautiful bridge. I think it's one that links our past and present, our country right across the country, especially now that everyone is virtual and actually further afield. And also, I think it links to institutions where we share many interests in Engineers Ireland and actually indeed memberships um, with iStruct D and Engineers Ireland. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. First, we have Councillor Kieran McCarthy, who's very much a Cork man, having been born grown up in Ballinlock in the city. He was elected to Cork City Council in 2009, again in May 2014, latterly in May 2019, as an independent city councillor for Cork South East in Cork City. He writes a weekly column for the Cork Independent, Our City, Our Town, and discusses local history and has written um, unbelievably 25 books, I, I believe, and won many awards and accolades. So looking certainly looking forward to that. On the engineering side, I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Minahan, who's a principal chartered engineer with RPS, Consulting Engineers, who works primarily in the design, inspection, assessment, and rehabil rehabilitations of, of bridges and large civil engineering infrastructure uh, projects. He's worked on, on many uh, large major projects throughout the UK uh, and Ireland and was the, the principal en engineer for this. Well, with, with that, I'm going to hand you over to hand you over to Michael and um, I guess Michael, take it away. Thank you. I think it's myself. Uh, Sorry, Paul, Brian, yeah. go first. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much for that introduction and, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I suppose what I propose to do over the next 20, 25 minutes or so is to, I suppose, give a potted history of Daly's Bridge and its surrounds, um, and especially talk maybe about the, the, I suppose, the evolving townscape actually around it and what led to the bridge, um, and also perhaps um, a lot of maybe the ferry crossing that actually was there beforehand. Um, for those of you, I know there are a few people who are online from uh, from up the country. Um, if you're entering Cork history for the first time, uh, we're very, very lucky in Cork. It's experienced every phase of Irish urban development. Um, so we had a, an early Christian monastery, we had a Viking Age past, Anglo-Norman, um, 18th century expansion, industrialization, 19th century Victorian time, 20th century and 21st century expansion. Um, and every phase of that, of development, kind of informs the next phase. Um, but the city wasn't built in one go, um, and so you, apart from this kind of multi-phase development of the city, uh, you also have the challenge of engineering a city on a swamp. Um, you've got the challenge of engineering a city on hills and underlining geology of limestone and sandstone. Um, some eras or phases of development are busier in development than, than other eras, so if you're trying to study Cork, um, you can be jumping around the place a little bit if you want to get the full picture. Um, some sites are more pivotal than others. Others, um, Some sites have become more famous than others. Um, and we, I have to say like that, the Maradike area and the site of the, shake, of the Shaky Bridge, Daly's Bridge and Daly's Bridge are probably are some of the most important foci in Cork history. So they're three centuries in the making and they're well photographed, they're well loved, all these areas. Um, and so what I want to do is just kind of bring, give you a part of history for five minutes or so, kind of to bring you up to through the 1700s, the 1800s. Um, so both the Maradike area as a, an area to develop was kind of 
began to be looked at first in the early 1700s. Um, so here's just um, a map of Cork City, the wall town of Cork, uh, in around 1601 by George Carew, the English plantation president. Um, and one of the things that happened to this town throughout the 1600s is that it became very busy economically. There was a huge butter and beef boom in the late 1600s, early 1800s. Uh, and so what happened in the early 1700s is that you got this massive morphological expansion, uh, this massive townscape expansion. So you can see all corners of the city expand. Um, so this is Southgate Bridge here, the drawbridge. So this, so this city kind of expands up Barrack Street, Shandon Street. Um, to the east into a, uh, an area called a walkabout area, which is a fortified island. Uh, today, Dawn Square would be here. Partick Street is this channel of water here. But in particular, in the early 1700s, there was massive development to the west. Um, they were known as the Western Marshes. Um, when I roll on the clock, so this is actually an upside down map from, uh, from 1750, but it tallies with the medieval map I just showed you uh, in terms of layout. Uh, and design uh, just before this one. Um, but in particular, um, this kind of shows that the wall town is gone by 1750. Um, the medieval laneways are still there. There's a whole series of bridges onto the marshes actually surrounding it. So bridges onto the western marshes, bridges onto the eastern marshes. Um, and if we start focusing just kind of over here um, on this area. So you'll see if I turn that map up to its right way around, it actually says Assembly House. So it's actually a bowling green. And if you look very carefully here, it says Mardike. Um, and so extending out from um, these newly developed Western marshes, complete with canals and houses and new streetscapes, um, you get this kind of walkway, uh, which was built um, in 1719, laid out by the town clerk with Cork Corporation, a man called um, Edward Weber. Um, now, Weber is, is, is crucial to the development of the Western Marshes, crucial to the early development of the Shaky Bridge site in Fitzgerald's Park area, the Mardike area. Um, we don't really get a sense from some of the mid 18th century maps on what the Mardike looked like. I mean, that last map I showed you basically shows the beginnings of a walkway. It, it, it doesn't actually give you a sense of um, its extent. So by 1774, uh, by O'Connor's map in 1774, we get, we get the extent of this gorgeous walkway, which is maybe nearly a mile in extent and um, built upon a raised mound uh, or vert um, and planted with trees, you can see. Um, if I start kind of zooming in and even maybe a little bit more, um, you can also get the sense of it. Um, this is just a massive feat of engineering um, and to all the engineers who, who work on aspects of, of Cork and um, try to engineer a city on a swamp and buildings on, on a swamp, uh, you, you know what I mean by the challenge of, challenges of building on a swamp. Um, but if I start kind of maybe zooming in even more, we do have accounts of maybe what this walkway looked like in the early 1800s. Um, so this is actually 1801. Um, so you can see Mardike Parade. Um, so you can see this extensive walkway. Um, you can see as well, there's this some, some sort of a laneway extending uh, off of here. And you can see there's a ferry crossing kind of into Sunday as well. Um, I'll come back to Sunday as well again um, in a few minutes, but definitely Sunday as well as a suburb, suburb began to be developed um, very much 1750s um, onwards. Um, we're lucky that we do have accounts of this Mardike walk um, around 1810. Um, a guy called William West, um, he talks that he talks about um, Edward Weber um, employing a man called E. Rickson um, to lay out this kind of gorgeous walk, and that it, it had a it was a gravelled walk. Um, maybe it was about 20 feet wide. It says admitting 10 or 12 persons abreast. Um, he's, the, he notes that Sir Samuel Rowland, one of the mayors of Cork, bestowed unusual attention to the walk uh, and caused it at all times to be kept in excellent order for the recreation of his fellow citizens. Um, and you can see as well that if, if he didn't enjoy his fellow citizens, um, he actually got rid of them. So you can see here that he removed, quote, lower orders of, the, of people that were actually removed from it. So it was very much a, a middle to higher class walk. Um, to keep people out, there was actually gates on both sides of it. Um, so gates at what's now the Sacred Heart Church side and gates at the Maradic uh, Parade um, side of it. So it also had a constable policing it, especially during the 1800s. Um, this is a, a painting of the uh, of the Maradic Walk from 1806. Um, the painting is probably done closer to the Maradic, Maradic Parade. I suppose in today's world, um, Presentation Secondary School actually would be here. Uh, um, 
So, I mean, today this is just uh, the Marlake Parade Road. It's an extensive roadway. Um, but you can see way back 200 years ago was a nice, pleasant area. You also get the sense of the Marlake stream. Uh, so there was a stream on both sides of this walkway. As I said, it was kind of a raised mound, a raised embankment. Um, the name Mardike, um, in I, I mentioned that Edward Weber developed it. Um, now, Edward, Edward Weber's original name for the Mardike was Meerdike. Um, so he was from uh, from the Netherlands. So Meerdike or Seadike, um, but Cork people just call it Mardike as actually time went on. Um, when you start zooming in on this kind of ferry um, area here, um, so today there still is ferry walk um, as, a, as, a, as a routeway by Fitzgerald's Park kind of running down uh, to what's now the site of the, the Shaky Bridge today or Daly's Bridge today, which was built on the site of the ferry. Uh, we do know from 1719 onwards, Edward Weber had a ferry to get across to Sunday as well, to ferry people from Sunday as well over to the walkway. Uh, we do know that by maybe 1750, the ferry service was taken over by the Carlton family uh, and we do know by late 1700s that the ferry service was taken over by the Dooley family. Um, now there was also a huge attraction in the Sunday as well area so on the map here you can see Sunday as well a well itself so this was a holy well. Um, there's this is what the well used to look like in terms of its well house uh, and today there's just a plaque on the wall. The road, Sunday's Well Road was widened way back in the 1930s, 1940s, and the well was actually taken away. But the plaque was actually left. You can see the date, 1644, uh, and that plaque kind of tallies with the old well house as well. So it was there well before Edward Weber built his Mardike Walk. So my, my, my gut is that the well lined up to the ferry to get across to the Mardike and so on, uh, and to give access as well to the Sunday's Well, re to the Sunday's well residents uh, to the Mardike Walk. Um, as for the ferry site, uh, we do know that John Dooley uh, sent in a massive complaint um, to uh, Co Corporation looking for compensation for the construction of Wellington Bridge, which is now uh, Thomas Davis Bridge, but he, only got, he was only granted £10 for his claim. Um, he admitted as he went to court with it that he had no exclusive rights. Uh, many of the ferry rights were actually granted by Co Corporation um, themselves. That ferry crossing was probably one of three or four crossings across the the, the North Channel of the River Lee. So that leads us through some of the maps of the 1830s. So here is the ferry crossing. Um, but you can see by the 1830s, um, there's a lot more in place here than just the Maradite Walk. Um, you can see the West, Western Road is in place. Um, and also you've got two jails, um, City Jail uh, and the County Jail, both kind of developed from 1820s onwards, and the City Jail opened in 1824, and the County Jail opened um, shortly afterwards. Um, it, it is interesting that the jails themselves are connected by these roads, um, and I do put a huge focus um, on the importance of, we say, Wellington Bridge, now Thomas Davis Bridge and Sunday's Well Road um, and Western Road going into Great George's Street, you can see here, which is now George, uh, George Washington Street or Washington Street uh, in our time. Um, but the ferry crossing was still important. You, uh, it also seems to be quite important that it's actually on um, the municipal boundary. Um, you can actually make out the municipal boundary here. So that's probably important symbolically that the ferry is on a municipal boundary as well, um, apart from a, a key piece of infrastructure between city jail and, uh, and the county jail. Uh, the ferry crossing, by the way, was just a rowing boat. It, it was nothing kind of extensive. So maybe you could hold maybe two or three people, you rowed across um, and that was kind of it. Um, this is kind of 1836. Um, again, you can see things like Western Road, uh, the Mardyk. Um, you can see the ferry uh, ferry walk is in place. Sun as well has become a very has has um, built up. You can see there are now um, several dwellings. One could give a talk in itself on the history of all these dwellings in Sunday as well for another time, and even the history of the jails that I mentioned. You can see things like Gill Abbey. Uh, probably what's important in this in this map is that you can see in the heart of the Mardyk or just off the Mardyk Walk is I think called shrubbery. Um, and so this was actually built by the Beamish family. They had a house in the heart of the uh, heart of the, uh, the Mardyke Walk. Um, the house is now Cork Public Museum in Fitzgerald's Park. Um, so if you're saying, what is this space here? Like it is Fitzgerald's Park that was actually built upon this in time. And I'll get to that just in a second. There were two other amenities as well added, um, 1849, uh, just off the Marina Walk, the Cork Cricket Club, um, and also in 1899, Sunday as well, Boating and Tennis Club. So they also added to like an attraction to bring people um, into the area. 
Um, this is actually a picture of Dooley's Ferry in the late 1800s uh, from the William Lawrence photographic collection. Um, in 1890, um, a gentleman working from, for the William Photographic Company, Robert French, um, came to Cork and other towns and villages right throughout the country. Uh, and this is his photograph of Mr. Dooley and his ferry. Um, and so you can see the ferry went across to kind of a sandbank here, and you, um, this is kind of one of Mr. Dooley's rowing boats as well. Um, today, if you go go looking at the spot where this boat is, you now the shaky bridge is built right across the spot today, um, as we know. But the mooring post is actually still there uh, for the rope for one of the for the, one of Dooley's rowing boats. So that's actually nice to still see that actually uh, in place. Um, so in terms of what did the Mardike Walk look like in late 1800s, um, so it had gorgeous trees, there was elm trees planted here in the 1860s, um, they lasted to the 1960s and it actually got caught Dutch elm disease and many of them actually had to, had to be cut down. So this actually a view is looking down towards Mardike, Mardike Parade, um, so, the, so Western Road comes up here by the gates of UCC, swings around kind of in towards here. Uh, and the, the start of the uh, the banks of the Lee Walkway, the skateboard park, are just in here. This is actually the Maradikes Bandstand, um, just over here. There's now an art project nearby um, called Bandstand on an old, an, an old ESB site, just, just maybe 10 metres to the right of that. Um, here's what the other kind of, so this is actually looking down towards what's now Fitzgerald's Park um, area. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like. So you can see lovely elegant lights, lovely elegant seats all the way down. Um, unfortunately, as time went on, these trees began to be cut down. There was more encroachment of housing um, from Western Road in terms of access to back gardens and lane maze and so on. So not much of this. Um, I'd love to see it restored to something like this, per my personal view of it, but it's, it's nice to see these pictures. Um, the, mo the next very big important thing that happened was actually the Cork International Exhibition in 1902, which was built kind of a, uh, on both sides of Ferry Walk, uh, both sides of the ferry crossing. Uh, this stream here actually was filled in, which kind of ran through the heart of what's now Fitzgerald's Park. Um, and we, they created something like this. Uh, this is the Cork International Exhibition from 1902. Um, so if you see over here, there's a giant slide. These are all actually prefabricated buildings. They're fibrous plaster that were put up very much for, well, they, they were put up for six months first and then the exhibition was a, a success. And then they ran the exhibition a second time in 1903. The total number of visitors uh, was 1 million uh, people in 1902, 1903. Um, now that this also deserves its own talk, but I, I just want to, this is just a, a gentle map. Um, now you can see here on the map, it says Ferry Walk. So Ferry Walk is a, abutting this huge industrial hall. Um, today, if you go looking for the industrial hall, you're not going to find it. It's now the children's playground in Fitzgerald's Park. You can see here water shoot, uh, and you can see the ferry crossing. Um, and you can see all these other buildings, concert hall, um, tea house, the shrubberies house, which is now Cork Public Museum, um, a machinery hall, uh, and other, other aspects. Um, this is the exhibition hall in 1902, 1903. This is all, um, as I say, fibrous plaster. Uh, you can see their ambition um, over 100 years ago was absolutely huge. They did build a lovely area in front of it where there was a, a, a fountain, which they called the Father Matthew Fountain. Um, as time went on, all the space, space here actually was flooded out to create a pond in the 1910s, and they actually kept the fountain uh, in the middle of the pond um, that they actually had constructed. Um, here's just a, a sketch of the Western grounds. Um, there was a whole series of uh, amusements um, so this is kind of their roller coaster uh, from 100 years ago, um, but you can see the ferry crossing is actually here. Um, I should also add, you, you'll see what, it, what looks like a, a gondola here. Um, the river was highly used during the Cork International Exhibition, so you could actually hire out a rowing boat and instead of someone singing you Italian songs, you were actually sang uh, Irish songs, Gaelic songs, because the exhibition was trying to promote um, national industry, Irish industry, that actually what it, what, that's what it set out to do. Um, and here's this great shoot. Um, so, so just behind that is the site of the ferry crossing. Um, so you can see there's a lot of playful stuff going on um, around this area um, leading up to the creation of the Shaky Bridge. Um, after the exhibition ended, um, a rugby grounds actually opened on the site of the recreational um, facilities that were uh, um, that, that, that I kind of mentioned. So this kind of site here, rugby ground, actually opened here in actually 1904. So it became another place of amusement. 
Um, Fitz Charles Park opened as a park um, in 1905, 1906. Um, it was named after Edward, Edward Fitzgerald, who was here um, standing. Edward Fitzgerald was, he was Lord Mayor of, of Cork, um, 1901, 1902, um, and they actually named the park after him, Edward Fitzgerald Park, because of the Great Exhibition. Um, so here's just another shot um, of those kind of, this from a shot from maybe the 1930s. Um, but if you do, these pillars are still there. And if you look above the pillars when you go into Fitzgerald's Park the next time, you'll see exhibition actually written on the top of the pillars here. And um, so they are, the pillars are actually from the, the Cork International Exhibition. Um, so that leads us quite nicely into, there's a lot of activity around the promotion of Fitzgerald's Park, um, rugby, um, sport. Um, it's, it's an area that has a, has a deep symbolic history in terms of promotion of Cork industry, national industry. Um, and as well as that, in 1908, um, a group of citizens from Sunday's Well, um, they approach their local councillors and they go, look, um, we have an issue. Uh, and the issue was kind of outlined in the Cork Examiner in 1908. Uh, and it says that they got a letter during the week from a Mr. Thomas Dooley, proprietor of the ferry at Ferry Walk, stating that he was willing to sell his interest um, in the ferry to the corporation for hundred pounds um, if they thought proper to purchase it. Um, and so basically the local councillors kind of um, said to the residents, look, we'll, we'll bring it into the committee with inside, with inside City Hall and we'll have a look at it. Um, now, interesting, the deputation that went to Cork Corporation didn't have James Daly in it, who I'll talk about in a few minutes, who gave funding for, for Daly's Bridge. Um, but let me just um, go on. So the Public Works Committee, now I know there's so much information on that particular slide on the left, but in a nutshell, um, the, the Public Works kind of committee, they met and they, they looked at the proposal of let's buy um, Mr. Dooley out for a hundred pounds. Um, but one of the issues the Public Works Committee actually had is that there was a number of Dooleys that had emigrated from um, their local house on Sunday as well. And there was a fear that the Dooleys in the States would actually approach the corporation saying, look, we, we want more money, um, that we, we're also entitled uh, to funding. Um, but the committee, the Public Work Com Works Committee did commission uh, John Delaney, the, the city engineer at the time, to have a look at the costing of actually building a bridge. Um, and it looks like looking at the Public Works meetings from 1908, 1909, that the bridge itself was too expensive uh, for the council to invest in. Um, the cop, the, the uh, of course, the councillors went back to their uh, the local re the local residents, kind of going. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Um, and uh, all these meetings were actually outlined in in the in uh, in the Cork Examiner at the time. So they did say it's not going to happen, and we're we're having a think about it. And things were kind of put very much on on a long finger. Um, Fourteen years later, um, the file was kind of taken out again. Um, so the 5th of February 1922 was the next update, so 14 years later, and I, I went through all the public work minute books in the Cork Arch Archives, um, scrolling through them with scrutiny saying, surely it's not 14 years later, and it was, um, and the, the Cork, Fis the Fitzgerald's Park Committee actually takes up the ongoing lobbying for a, a suspension bridge, and they do mention suspension bridge in 1922, so there have been maybe some sort of informal discussion that it wasn't going to be like a bridge like Parkex Bridge or Parliament Bridge that was going to be a cheaper style of bridge if it was going to be constructed. Uh, in the meantime, of course, the, the Dooley family seemed to die, die off as well. Um, and that leads us quite nicely into my last few slides of just um, James Daly stepped forward. So he, he lived in uh, in Shanachiel, in Vineville in Shanachiel. This is actually a segment from his obituary in 1942. Um, he was from County Waterford. Uh, he began life as in his native district as a butter and egg merchant. And then he actually set up his own margarine uh, factory in Cork in the Shandon area. Was very well respected, employed a whole range of uh, employees, maybe over 100 employees, uh, made a lot of money. Um, and decided to invest his money in, in, the, in the suspension bridge um, project. Um, also, he worked very carefully with the Cork City engineer at the time, um, Stephen Farrington. Um, now, Stephen Farrington was born in Cork City, came from a distinguished Cork Presbyterian family, studied at Cork University, um, worked for a time in Northern Ireland, um, first with Belfast Corporation, then with Belfast and County Down Railway, was a town surveyor with Lisburn and County Antrim, and then was appointed a city engineer of Cork just before Cork Corporation was dissolved 
which is a story in itself where two councillors were found to be um, corrupt and it led to a whole um, inquiry uh, and the council cock operation was, was dissolved for five years. So there were no councillors for five years and a gentleman called Philip Monaghan and became the city commissioner and eventually city, um, city manager uh, in 1929. Um, but Stephen Farrington hit the ground running. Um, so you can see that he was kind of, um, he was in his 40s, kind of mid 40s. Um, he was very much um, the city engineer, held the post of city engineer until 1958. Um, he lectured in municipal engineering in, in UCC, um, fluent speaker of Irish and French, active member of the Cork Literary and Scientific Society, was also a keen sailor with the Cork Boat Club. Had a huge interest in water um, and the filtration of water in particular. I'll come back to that actually in a second. Um, they looked at the catalogue of David Rowell and Company, which I know that Michael in, a few, in, in one or two minutes now will actually have a look at as well and bring up. Um, and they, they basically bought a bridge from a catalogue from David Rowell and Company. Um, and the bridge arrived in crates and they assembled the bridge in, in early 1927 on the banks of the River Lee next to Fitzgerald's Park. That, in a nutshell, that's actually what happened. Um, we're, we're very, very lucky. We do have the expense detail for Daly's Bridge. Um, so we actually have the estimates and the cost. So it does look like that their estimate was 721 pounds, um, but their cost actually came in at 675 pounds. Um, now today, in today's money, that's 45, about 45,000 euros. Um, I'm not too sure how much of all of this Mr. Daly gave to it. I'd say he probably gave the bulk of 90% of it is my, is my own gut on it. So he probably gave the bulk of what's 40,000 euros in today's money. This was big money back then. Um, he was also probably close to retirement. We do have pictures of him, which I'll show you in a second. Um, Mr. Daly didn't do the honours of opening the bridge on the 9th of April 1927. It was actually given to a peace commissioner and um, that he actually knew, um, a, a guy called Mr. M. O'Driscoll, I, I, probably Michael O'Driscoll, I don't have his first name. Um, so Mr. O'Driscoll did the honours. Um, the speech, during the speeches, Mr. Philip Monaghan, of course, was quick to note the importance of Mr. Daly. Um, so he's, he just said here, and I, I'm not going to read all of it, but he says there was one infallible test. How much are those people who urged these projects ready to pay down? The test was put to Mr. Daly and he answered it magnificently. He was the only Corkman I've ever met to answer the test. I, I am not without hope that the example of Mr. Daly would be followed by others, um, end quote. So that was Philip Monaghan. Um, so there are other pictures in the examiner. Um, during the day, so there's the favorite, the famous picture of of, of Mr. Day of Mr. Uh, um, of, of of the opening of the bridge um, with Mr. O'Driscoll. But there are other images that actually show Mr. Daly actually giving notes to Stephen Farrington, giving notes actually to to uh, uh, to Mr. O'Driscoll. So here's Mr. Daly. So you can see he's an elder, he is an elderly gentleman. Could be the, maybe he just wanted to give something back to the city. Uh, but it's actually I I know his family are still in Cork, um, and I, I need to do some more work uh, on just getting images from him for him and so on, and learning more about him as well. Um, Mr. James Daly, he said to the press at the time, um, "Quote: I have for many years endeavouring to get the bridge erected." Um, there was a lot of obstacles in the way, but with the assistance of the committee and others who saw clearly the great necessity of this bridge, they succeeded in clearing the way. And we now have the great pleasure of seeing the bridge complete and being open to the public, um, end quote. That was this, um, and it was also then this kind of the, the official kind of group um, photograph. Um, and these, these were kind of key officials at the time. So Commissioner Monaghan was there, Stephen Farrington was there. So Stephen is somewhere kind of, um, somewhere, I think this gentleman here, so, um, as far as I know. Um, so let's kind of go on. So just my last concluding slides, just maybe to put it in more context of what was happening at the time. Um, so Stephen was working with Philip Monaghan um, and Philip Monaghan in the 1920s um, um, assembled a fantastic team um, to deal with the fallout of the Burnley of Cork um, City in particular. So half of Parkett Street had been burned down, it was in ruins, so there had to be projects kind of to rebuild the city. So Stephen was in instrumental in making sure and pushing architects um, to rebuild. He was also instrumental as time went on in his insight and in um, designing with Daniel Levi, uh, who was a city architect at the time, uh, to construct 150 houses at Capitol Road and Turner's Cross um, in the late 1920s. He also, Stephen also worked closely with John C. Saunders, a Dr. Jack Saunders, who was the medical officer of health, um, who actually set up vaccination clinics in Cork um, in the early 1930s, a really interesting guy, and also decided to, he went into every slum area of the city and, and between Stephen um, Jack Saunders 
um, and um, Philip Monaghan. Um, they cleared, um, certainly in the early, early 1930s, 90, um, 20 acres of slums to create Grana Braher, and they kept going for, for 30, 40 years. Um, so it's great credit is due to this team that Philip Monaghan assembled. And um, the earlier projects that Philip Monaghan had in mind, and he gave a speech in, 19, um, in early 1925 for the Cork Rotary Club, and he said that he wanted to clean up the water supply uh, in the city, uh, and that he wanted to put in new sewage schemes. Um, so that was one of, so if one of, um, apart from kind of looking at the shaky bridge, Stephen Farrington also had to come up with a new filtration plant and build a new filtration plant um, on the Lee Road. And of course that one today has been replaced by the Irish Water one. So it has lasted the test of time um, a long time. Um, there was also other projects, cattle market and do a civic survey of Cork, which probably is the first um, city development plan for the city in 1926. It's really interesting to have a read. Um, and just my last two, three slides, um, to put Daly's Bridge in context, um, it was a really interesting year in 1927. Um, so the last few buildings that had been burned out from the Barney of Cork were completed. So Rocha stores, caches were actually completed. Um, the first Fesh Machu in Cork actually opened. A new wireless broadcasting station opened on the, in the old Cork City Jail. The collection of tolls and the city's approach roads abolished. So there was a real great sense of modernization. And also you see here in March, 1927, the first proposal for a Cork industrial fair, which, which was gonna be held in the Lee Fields. Um, also the first set of ex-servicemen housing in Banlock are built. Uh, plans and tenders for the new city Grand Parade City Library uh, were completed because the library, the Carnegie Library was burnt out in 1920. Surveys began for the erection of, of poles to carry electricity from Shannon to Cork, um, from Ardna Crusher. Uh, Terra concrete is poured in, on the Carragher Straight Road. So there, um, Stephen's other projects was actually to get rid of these mud gravel streets we had in Cork and actually um, um, concretize them, if I, can, if I can use that word. Um, also, there were other things that actually opened. Cork Operation House, the Capital Road were completed. Um, and to mark the completion of the rebuilding of all the buildings, there was a Cork Christmas Carnival opened in December 1927. Uh, and as well as that, connected to that, there was an exhibition of the new Ford Model A. Um, so the Model T Ford was gone as a new, a new, new cars were actually emerging. So it was an interesting time to be in Cork. And my last two pictures, here's what kind of emerged. Um, this is Stephen Farrington's world. So he was certainly responsible for the concreting of the streets um, and certainly responsible for influencing um, not only the construction of the shaky bridge, Daly's Bridge, um, but also many of these gorgeous buildings here on the left um, in terms of their reconstruction. Um, you can see this building up here, this building up here, and all the buildings kind of further down. And this is my last slide. Is This is kind of my favourite slide of Cork in the 1930s. Like new streets brought people who could cycle a lot more. They also brought an omnibus system to Cork. Um, and the omnibus system and the new streets led to the elimination of the tramway system in the city. Um, and the trams disappeared because cars could actually move quicker. Um, and it's interesting in our time, we're trying to reconstruct the trams, we're trying to reconstruct a, a, a tramway element. But certainly Stephen Farrington and what he tried to do um, um, way back in the 1920s, 1930s, is worthy of more research um, and worthy of its own paper. So I'm going to park it there. Uh, and I know Michael Menahan is going to pick up uh, and looking at kind of what happened to Shaky Bridge uh, in, in our present time. Um, so it is important to put the Shaky Bridge in its context of a time of modernity, a time of change, uh, and a time of improving how our city actually worked and how our city was developing for its future, uh, and very much creating an Irish free state city. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. We'll hand over to Michael there. Yes. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Minahan. I'm a principal engineer at RPS based out of our Cork office and I'll be covering the recent project for the repair and rehabilitation of Daly's Bridge or the Shaker Bridge in Cork City. 
So a bit of background on RPS to start, uh, for anyone who may not be familiar with us. RPS is a, an international consultancy with a presence in 125 countries across six continents. Uh, it is one of Ireland's leading multidisciplinary consultancies. Uh, and we have over 700 specialists uh, working across our offices in Dublin, Cork, Galway, Sligo and Belfast. Uh, a selection of RPS's recent and local projects are shown on screen, including Hallboland Island East Tip Remediation, which has transformed a way site into a public park. Um, RPS are working with the Port of Cork. Sorry, previous slide. Hall Boland are, are, are working with uh, the Port of Cork in the redevelopment of an existing port facility uh, in, in Ringskiddy. Um, our bridge team works on a, a range of bridge projects in Ireland and the UK. And one of our, our signature projects in the last decade would have been uh, Mizzenhead Bridge, uh, looking at, located at the most southerly point in Ireland. Um, RPS delivered, recently delivered in 2019, Skibbereen Flood Relief Scheme. Um, we've worked uh, since the 1970s on Ballymore Uses Water Treatment Plant, which is the largest water treatment plant in Ireland. And we've also worked on a range of waste projects, including the Dublin Waste Energy uh, Scheme, which is uh, located in, Pe in Poolbeg. To give you an overview of what, I, of what we'll, we'll be covering in this presentation, um, We'll start with uh, the location history, uh, carry on from some, some elements that Kieran has, has left, has, has given us great context in. Um, we'll give you a brief description of the structure. We'll cover the, the structural, or sorry, the special inspection, which was undertaken in 2017. Uh, we'll cover the site investigations uh, and material testing, which would have then informed the structural assessment. We'll cover the, the rehabilitation works. Uh, and the approach to conservation, given that we're working on a protected structure. Uh, we'll cover some of the site constraints and challenges associated with the location of the bridge. Uh, we'll cover some aspects of the design and contract documents. Uh, we'll cover some progress shots during construction, uh, showing the key, the key uh, phases. Um, we'll also cover, before the end, we'll cover some elements of the structural dynamics or, or the vibration response to the bridge. So essentially we'll cover some elements of, of the science behind the shake, uh, and then we'll finish off uh, with some questions to conclude. So Daly's Bridge provides a pedestrian route over the Northern Channel of the River Lee, connecting Sunday's well to the North uh, to Fitzgerald's Park in the South. Um, you also have um, UCC's Maradike Arena located just, just south of the bridge. Uh, there's also another bridge, um, a few hundred meters to the west, Thomas Davis Bridge or Wellington Bridge, as is also known. Um, just to continue on in terms of history, you know, Kieran covered this very well in terms of the context of the, the ferry crossing. So the bridge replaced an earlier ferry, ferry crossing, which was Duty's Ferry. Uh, so these are further images of, of the ferry in operation. Um, you have a good view in the middle here of the old ferryman's cottage, uh, the old landing spot in the beached area. Uh, and the, to the south, you, um, the original ferry steps are still in place and you have the old uh, ferry key as well. So the, this is taken just back in 2017 in our initial inspection. So the, it's interesting that the, the, the original ferry steps are still in place. The bridge opened in 1927, so it is fast approaching its 100th anniversary. Um, you know, it was named after James Daly, who, who part funded the project. It was designed by Cork City engineer S.W. Farrington, with steelwork provided by David Rowell and Company of Westminster. And we'll cover that in some more detail in, in the upcoming slides. Um, the bridge is included on the record of protected structures and, and the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. Um, other elements in, in this, in other elements of the bridge or around the bridge are also included on the, on the NIAH, including the cast iron southern railings, uh, the key walls and the ferry steps. Um, the bridge is recognized as, as a significant contributor to the architect, architectural heritage of the city. Um, it is the only suspension bridge in Cork City and is the only surviving bridge of its kind in Ireland. So there's a few historic photos here showing the, the bridge soon after opening. Uh, and I think you've, you've seen this picture in, in Kieran's presentation also, the Peace Commissioner opening the bridge uh, in 1927. 
So archive information was kindly provided to us by the Institution of Civil Engineers in relation to David Rowell's bridges. Um, and that information included brochures, uh, specifications, uh, drawings, and, and the, the original material price list. So Kieran, Kieran has included this in, in the previous slide. Uh, lots of interesting information. So this was sent from David Rowell to SW Farrington as a record of um, the material and price list. And as, as Kieran uh, pointed out in his presentation, um, the bridge was delivered under budget. So the estimate was £721 uh, and the actual cost ended up being just over £675. So this slide shows extracts from Rowell's brochures. So Rowell's uh, system of suspension bridges comprised a kit of parts uh, and the brochures contained several standard bridge types that the customer could adapt based on the span and the type of loading. Uh, so interestingly, the brochure refers to a bridge in Cork, which of course is Daly's Bridge, and it also refers to a bridge in Kilkenny, uh, which is no longer standing. Rowell's bridges were built across the British Empire, and this, slides, this slide gives some samples. Um, the top, the photos given at the top of the slide are all bridges across the UK, mainly throughout England and Wales. Um, and the bottom three bridges are located uh, in more exotic locations, including this one in the Falkland Islands, um, the middle one here in Chile, and this one here in the right in New Zealand. So Daly's Bridge may be the only bridge of its type in Ireland, uh, but as we can see here, it is part of a, a family of Rowell bridges located across the world. So these photos are of Rowell's bridge that was located in Kilkenny. So the bridge spanned the River Nore and was known locally as Talbot's Inch Bridge. Uh, it was built in 1906, uh, but sadly, as you can see in the second photo, it was washed away in a major flood in 1947. So Mizzenhead Bridge was included at the start of this presentation, uh, and there's an interesting link between that bridge and Daly's Bridge, which is worth mentioning here. So a design competition was held in the early 1900s for the original bridge crossing at Mizzen, and the drawing on screen shows David Rowell's design entry. Uh, so you can see here there's remarkable similarities between um, the, what's shown here on his design entry and Shaky Bridge that is standing to this day. So you've essentially the same tower, uh, the you know the same cross bracing, same pointed finials, same lattice truss. Um, it's it's also roughly the same span. So the Mizzen Bridge was was a 50 meter span. Shaky Bridge is is, is 51 meter span. Um, so. Rowell's entry didn't win the design competition, uh, and as we know, the reinforced concrete art structure uh, was subsequently completed in, in 1909, um, but we very nearly had two shaky bridges in Cork. So David Rowell erected over 50 bridges that we have record for, uh, and this slide gives a timeline which we pulled together um, in order to get a context and a feel for where Daly's Bridge fitted in his overall um, catalogue of bridges. Um, so his production, as, as, as we see, it started in 1901 and finished in 1958. Um, and Daly's Bridge, constructed in, in 1927, is around about just, just over halfway through. Um, the bridges, the names that are given in orange are the only ones that are not remaining or that have washed away in flood or, or for whatever reason are, are no longer there. Um, so the vast majority of Rowell's bridges are still standing or, or are still in use, which is a true testament to the design and quality of the Rowell system. So back, back, to, back to Shaky Bridge, this slide gives a reveal sketch to help describe the various components of the structure. So this is our reveal sketch there. So the bridge consists of a single 51 meter long cable supported span with parallel steel lattice trusses supporting timber decking. The trusses are suspended from solid steel hangers, uh, which are connected to twin wire rope cables. At each side, the cables in turn are suspended from saddles, which are located uh, on top of each uh, lattice tower. And then the suspension cables are anchored in turn from buried foundations located behind each tower. 
RPS were appointed by Cork City Council in 2017 to undertake a special inspection and structural assessment on Daly's Bridge. Uh, the inspection highlighted numerous, numerous serious defects, which included advanced corrosion and damage throughout the lattice trusses, particularly at the node points. So if you look at these two images here, these are uh, would be fairly common across the structure. Um, so at these node points uh, of these lattice built up members uh, where you have these mating faces or the crisscross members, and it's quite common to get uh, over time when the paint system starts to go, you get some water trapped behind the mating face, which causes this expansive corrosion. So that, that was that was some of the more serious damage across the structure and it was widespread, uh, widespread across the deck. There was also inadequate hanger to, trans to transverse beam deck connections. So this is one such example here. Um, wire breakages were also observed to the suspension cables. So this, this shows here. So some of the outer wires here had started to break. Um, and this is caused by fraying or, or, what's, or fatigue damage or what's termed as fraying of the cables. So the, cab the cables, particularly at the Maradike side, at the certain side would oscillate under pedestrian loading. So someone's crossing on the bridge and the cables start to oscillate. Uh, you multiply those oscillations by a few hundred thousand cycles or, or a million cycles over the hundred years of the bridge or so and you're going to start getting some fatigue damage and that's the main reason why we have some of these uh, individual wire breakages um the bridge is located in what we term a, a high corrosive environment or c4 uh, environment in terms of paint work uh, and exposure uh, main reason for that is we're located we're not located too far from from park harbor here only seven kilometers or so or, and you have there a, a moderate saline environment. So you have airborne salts and chlorides reaching, reaching the bridge. And that, that's one of the main reasons why you have, you have this level of, of, of damage. <clears throat> so due to the difficulty accessing all parts of the structure, uh, the intricate nature of the lattice work, <clears throat> and the need to acquire detailed and accurate survey information to inform a structural assessment. A full three-dimensional terrestrial laser scan was undertaken. Uh, the 3D scan was capable of picking up um, geometric imperfections in members, which included crookedness and member bow. So we're particularly interested in those types of things when doing our structural assessment. As you can see on screen there, um, the, the, the point cloud output from, from the laser scan of the 3D scan of the bridge. Uh, On-site measurements were undertaken during the inspection. Uh, and, and other traditional surveying techniques were used to confirm the accuracy of the scan. Uh, a 3D Revit model was also generated uh, as an output of the scan, and you can see that model there on the right-hand side of the screen. Site investigation works and material testing were undertaken to further inform the structural assessment. So this slide gives a summary, um, and just to go through it, uh, that included localized excavations and GPR to define the extents of the buried cable anchorage foundations. Uh, so this picture gives um, shows those excavations and, and in the Maradek uh, within UCC grounds uh, to uncover uh, the cable connection uh, and the buried foundation. So these these originally would have been exposed uh, of old when the bridge was built, but the the ground was gradually built up in, in the Maradek since then, and that's why they're, they're buried to this extent. Now uh, we took slit trenching for utilities, uh, a suite of concrete tests of concrete testing. Uh, we did a suite of, of steelwork testing, including um, material identification, hardness, and chemical composition. We did tensile testing of the structural steel plate work. So we took tokens, uh, steel tokens from the bridge. Uh, we took tokens from elements that we knew we were going to be removing uh, in, in, in the interest of minimal intervention. Um, all test specimens recorded uh, initial yield strengths above 300 newtons per millimeter squared. So this graph shows uh, one of those test results. Um, so with that, so with that um, and the material identification, uh, we could conclude that we had really high quality carbon manganese steels, uh, properties uh, which would be comparable to modern S275 steels. So um, again, this goes to, to the testament of Raul's system. Um, he, he really employed really high quality steels in, in, in his bridges. Uh, we also undertook uh, weldability testing. Um, Pain sampling and testing for lead content. So we're always concerned about lead content and we're dealing with old painted metal structures because they did use lead um, 
laid in, in, in original paint in, in, in old paint specs. Um, we also facilitated access for tower saddle inspections. Um, so we accessed uh, the saddles and removed the finials, uh, which houses um, the cables over the tower. Um, so we were, they were actually in remarkably good condition. The cables were in really good condition over the saddle. The saddle, which is uh, essentially just a cast steel block, was in great condition. And you could actually still see some of the grease, um, that, the original grease that was on the cables within the saddles. So a structural assessment was undertaken to BD21 and BD56. Uh, a full 3D analysis model was built based upon the laser scan geometry. So that's a view of our 3D analysis model. Um, allowances were made for corrosion through reduction in cross-sectional area and stiffnesses of the various members according to the damage that we observed on site. Uh, and the outcome of the structural assessment um, was that there was insufficient capacity at ULS to sustain the full live load beyond three to four years from the date, the date of inspection. So that was allowing for further progression of corrosion within our models uh, and seeing at what point in time um, uh, that, that um, the live load can no longer be taken. Um, so the results of the, of the structural assessment uh, combined uh, with the findings of the inspection, um, the overall structure was assigned a condition rating of three uh, which indicates significant damage with repair needed very soon, um, i.e. within the next financial year. So essentially, um, at that point in time, urgent intervention was required in order to prevent uh, a load restriction or eventual bridge closure. So a project team um, was assembled in 2018 to progress the rehabilitation works. Um, the project was part funded by um, Cork City Council, uh, the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport and the National Transport Authority. Um, RPS were appointed as lead consultants, uh, PSTP and employers rep. Um, Jack Collin Architects or JCA who were based locally in Sunday as well, they were appointed as conservation architect uh, and CIS, CSIS based out of Dublin were appointed as paintwork and welding specialists. The key aims um, for the rehab works uh, were, were to repair and address structural defects and damage present at the bridge, <coughs> to maximize the remaining service life of the bridge. So we were aiming, we were, we were aiming for another 100 years if we could um, at design stage, um, to upgrade approaches to create a more open, attractive and inviting experience for users, uh, to improve the bridge as a walking and cycling amenity and to further promote the sustainable transport modes within Cork City, uh, to apply the principles of conservation, to preserve the architectural heritage of the bridge, uh, and to improve access for future inspections and maintenance. Conservation principles were central to the development of the rehabilitation works. Uh, our approach to conservation included uh, collation of archive information. So that included a lot of the information we, we covered previously and that we received from the IC archives. Um, the appointment of a grade one accredited conservation architect, uh, that was JCA, uh, to research the full history and significance of the bridge before embarking on any detailed design of, of repair works. Um, a knowledge sharing relationship was established between the project team and Aberdeenshire Council, uh, and that led ultimately to a study visit to Paul Hollick Footbridge, located in Scotland, so that, that pictures of that bridge are, are, are given on screen. Um, so that was a really worthwhile exercise. Um, Paul Hollick Footbridge had suffered damage during Storm Frank, and, and Aberdeenshire Council were had just completed repairs to the bridge. Um, so we we undertook a lessons learned and knowledge sharing exercise with them and and which 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 informed uh, the development of our of our detail design uh, it looks a lot like one of Rawls bridges but uh, but it but it isn't um it is it is another system called the harper louis harper system uh, again another prolific uh, bridge system which um there are 50 or 60 across the british empire also but um, very similar bridge and very similar nature of works to what we were doing at Daly's Bridge. So it was really a uh, timely study visit. In terms of the principles of conservation, um, our key aims were to undertake the minimum level of intervention 
retaining as much of the original material as possible. Uh, where where damage is present and it wasn't salvage, salvageable and new material is required, like for like replacement um, was under, is undertaken in terms of detailing and work methods. Um, another key aim was to restore original details and features at the bridge and approaches, uh, particularly where alterations to the character of these elements have been made since 1927. So in terms of site constraints, um, there, are, there are many at the, at, at the bridge location. Um, first one is working over an adjacent to a, a significant water course. So water levels can get quite high at the bridge. Um, ordinarily, there's not much of a, of a, of a tidal range given that we've weir, we have a weir located uh, upstream and downstream of the bridge, close to the bridge. Um, but but water, water levels naturally do rise due to um, rainfall events and you have any, any, any water that's released from in Inascara Dam obviously has, has an impact at the bridge. Um, it's an environmentally sensitive location. Um, we have different and adjacent land uses, so it's primarily um, residential to the north and we're, we're skirting very close, in fact, directly adjacent to two properties on, on the northern approach and at the northern abutment. Um, we have the Mardike Arena here to the south and our southern cables and anchorages and foundations are actually located in UCC grounds, so that's a that's a key challenge. Um, it's a confined urban site. There's not much space at all, um, so it is very limited access also for plant and machinery. So the, the only real real way into the bridge uh, with a vehicle is is via ferry walk, which goes back down to Maradike Walk at a tight T junction. So it's very difficult to get a vehicle of any size down the ferry walk. Um, and it's given the gradient at Sunday as well. Uh, you're, at, you're at one in four, one in five coming down there. It's very steep. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible really to get a, a vehicle from Sunday as well or any types of site, site machinery down from Sunday as well to, to the Northern Bank. Um, sorry, skip down there. Um, the presence of invasive species is another key constraint, um, which we'll cover in the next slide. So we, we, we found some invasive species in our surveys at, at the North Bank. Uh, pedestrian traffic management is, is, is another key challenge. Uh, we're shutting the bridge uh, for, for over six months. Uh, we need to organize a suitable diversion route uh, for pedestrians. And also we need to keep uh, the walkway along the River Lee here that leads into Sunday as well. We need to keep that open at all times of construction. So that's another, another key challenge. <laughs> So Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed were encountered at the northern, the northern bank uh, in terms of invasive species. So you can see here in the plan drawing, uh, the extensity. So the Himalayan balsam is shown in blue, which is fairly extensive. There were some areas of, of Japanese knotweed around the north abutment also, perilously close to the north abutment. Um, so the strategy here, normally, ordinarily, we just treat the Japanese knotweed or, or, and the Himalayan balsam and, and stay away from it. But, uh, given it, given its proximity to the bridge uh, and the nature uh, and aims of the work to upgrade the approaches uh, and the landscaping, um, it was decided to to remove and dispose of the invasive species. So uh, we prepared an invasive species management plan, which supported a successful license application to the National Parks and Wildlife Services for the removal and disposal of the invasive species. Um, so it is, it, it, is, it is illegal to, to remove or dispose of um, these types of species without a license. So um, it's a fairly involved process um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, removal and disposal. There was a range of other consents and consultations undertaken during the project and the development of the project. And that included um, a screening or appropriate assessment screening to assess the potential impact of the proposed works on designated sites uh, located downstream within Cork Harbour. Um, we also liaised with the uh, National Parks and Wildlife Services in Land Fisheries Ireland, Office of Public Works. Um, the DTAS, or the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport, were the technical approval authority in this project also, and we would have submitted uh, our technical acceptance report to them, which is essentially a, a, a record of the design basis 
um, the difference that the, that the standards are using, the loading you're applying, it's a record of, of, of how you're going to take your detailed design before you do it. Um, we'd have liaised closely with the local heritage officer uh, at all stages of the project in terms of um, the proposals. Uh, and the, pro the project was also put through the Part A planning process. Um, so as part of that process and other forums, uh, uh, we, we received um, uh, a really strong desire from the public. Uh, the, 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 their, mes their, their message was that they, they wanted to retain the shake. Uh, so that really uh, put ex added focus on us um, in order to make sure that happened. So the, sco the scope of works taken through detailed design um, are given on screen. So it included the, the phase dismantling of the lattice deck uh, for off-site blasting, steel of repairs, repainting and phase re-erection. So we developed a, a phasing of the works, uh, essentially a construction sequence um, to support this. So um, you can see at the top there, the, de the deck comes down onto floating pontoons. So a key aspect of, of the works that were developed is that there should be no in-stream works, temporary or permanent. Um, so the deck is lowered onto the floating pontoons, uh, removed off site, um, and then the, the towers are fully encapsulated for blasting, repair, and repainting in situ. Um, we have replacement of the suspension cables given that they're uh, at end of life. Um, there's reinforced concrete works to approach ramps and cable anchorage foundations. Uh, we have new approach parapets, um, repair and repainting of the cast iron railings to the south. Um, upgrades to the approaches, including a new plaza area to the south and surf new surfacing and landscaping throughout. Um, installation of new public lighting to the approaches, to the ramps and to the ridge. And removal and disposal of the invasive species, as we just discussed. So an extensive defect inspection of every element of the bridge was undertaken uh, and repairs were scheduled in graphical and tabular form on the drawings, uh, as you can see here. Uh, with bespoke specifications linking to the corresponding repair detail over here and to the bill of quantity items. So as you can see, there's a, there's a, there's a vast array of defects on the bridge uh, and it was important to, to record them all explicitly. Uh, we thought this was necessary to ensure the works were described as completely as possible prior to tender uh, in keeping with the requirements of the public works contracts, which are generally lump sum in nature. Uh, the widespread and varied nature of the steelwork defects and the desire to undertake the minimum level of intervention led to a wide array of bespoke platework repair details. So these are, some of these are shown on screen. Um, so there, there are over 30 separate repair details uh, to the lattice deck alone. Again, this is all going back to the, to the level of minimum intervention that we want to undertake. Um, we felt we needed to go uh, to the nth degree on the repairs to make sure that we're only removing the localized sections that need a repair and we're not just stripping out um, meters and meters of members that are otherwise uh, outside of the specific def defect are okay. Uh, 3D modeling techniques were used effectively throughout the design phase, uh, and one of those is shown on screen, uh, which is the intricate reinforcement and cable anchorage connection to the existing buried foundations. So you can see the original configuration here, buried at, at the Maradike end with the connector under the ground. So we needed to get down to that level, we needed to double in with reinforcement, and we needed to bring the, the new, we needed to bring the concrete plinth up above ground level. Uh, and then create a plated assembly for the new uh, cable system. So you can see here the reinforcement detailing on, on the right uh, with the dowels installed first and then the, the cage fitted over that and then the, the cable system anchored within it. Uh, so these types of complicated connections can cause havoc on site in terms of making sure everything fits. So we felt uh, modeling it explicitly in 3D um, would avoid any clashes or conflicts on site. Uh, which turned out to be the case, it, it, worked, it worked very well. Um, the lighting design was uh, heavily influenced by the findings of ecological surveys. Um, so there was various species of aquatic fish life in the River Lee. Uh, so the aim was to avoid excessive light spill onto the river and riparian zones along the banks. Um, there was also four species of bats 
uh, commuting and foraging in the area of the bridge. Um, so the strategy there is that we want to avoid uplighting, direct uplighting of, of the structure. Um, and also um, we specified low lux levels. Uh, so lux level is the, is the intensity of the light. Um, so we wanted a low lux level, this kind of diffuse uh, light spread that is focused on the walkway. Um, th those low, low lux levels uh, help mitigate any, any negative impact on, on, on bats in the area. So you can see some of the some of the output from the the, the, the lighting model that was developed at design stage, uh, and there would have been a lot of tweaking involved in the angle of the linear lighting channel uh, versus the deck to ensure that we were avoiding uh, a lot of light spill on 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 the on the river. Um, there's also a, a CMS system or a central management system for the lighting control. So that's essentially uh, this innovative wireless system which you can remotely change the light intensity um, and the color. Uh, so you can change the, 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 the lighting design is, is um, such that the color can be changed for any special events. And uh, you see some examples of that in, in later slides. Uh, the public works contract for minor building and civil engineering works was used with a two-stage restricted procedure. So stage one involved the pre-qualification of six contractors to the tender shortlist. Uh, and stage two involved the, the issue of the full tender documents to the shortlisted contractors. Uh, we organized a pre-bid information meeting and site visit during the tender period. So all, all contractors uh, were invited to attend on site where we would have given them a presentation and, and walked the site with them. Um, that, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be normal, but for a project like this, we felt it was required um, given the, the nature of the site, the complexity of the works, various constraints that we've been through uh, just so the contractors were fully fully aware and uh, could appropriately price the risk associated with a job like this. So Keaton Construction were appointed in July 2019 for a tender sum of 1.48 million euro and construction commenced the following month in August 2019. So the following few slides will chronicle some of the construction stage activity. Um, so the deck was dismantled in four sections in September 2019. Uh, so you can see here an aerial view of the dismantling of the first deck section. And in the second image, you can see the, there's temporary spreader beams that were placed underneath each deck section. And then um, when the deck was, um, when the connections uh, were removed from the deck, um, it was lowered onto a floating pontoon uh, by block and tackle techniques. So essentially the men, the men there are, are pulling on the chains in order to lower the deck down incrementally onto the, onto the pontoon, the floating pontoon. Um, the deck sections were then transported to Mackie Plant Fabrication Shop in Nina. So that's the, those are the deck sections soon after arrival and stripping of the, of the timber decking. Um, so after, soon after they arrived in Mackie, we would have given them uh, a sweep blast, uh, a light grip blast. Uh, so they can see it after there. So that's basically just to remove the, the paintwork and any mill scale. Um, and then what, was, what, what followed was detailed inspections uh, of each, uh, of every member on the bridge again, uh, and marking out exactly the final agreed um, repair extents and details across the entire bridge, uh, corresponding to the drawings and any other, any other issue that arose during the inspection was picked up also. So this slide gives two of the most common repair details used on the scheme, um, which would have been at the node points, as we pointed out before, they're, they're, they're the most vulnerable part, of, vulnerable part of these types of structures. So these are two uh, top card uh, node and an intermediate web node. Um, so that, that's the before picture, obviously. And then you have the, the repair detail, and then you have the, the finished repairs in each case. So bespoke dome-headed bolts uh, were fabricated for this project. Um, we're conscious that we're in, in certain places we need to remove a rivet or a rivet is already missing or a rivet is gone. So they would have been hot riveted uh, on, on, on our old system. We don't do hot riveting anymore and we don't want to lose the, the look of the rivet or have um, big hexagonal bolt heads on, on the pedestrian side. So it was decided to fabricate bespoke uh, dome-headed bolts uh, with the dome located on, on, on the decking side. So the top, the top card is a 33 mil diameter, do uh, diameter dome, and then the, 
the intermediate, the, the lower ones have a smaller dome size at, at 26 mil diameter. So these were, these were used across the entire bridge um, uh, dome head of bolts. So the hanger clamps were removed and fully refurbished. So you can see there was, um, the hanger clamps weren't in great condition. Um, they've actually been groated since 1927. So when they were installed first day, they were, they were, they were never groated. Um, and they have been since. So we cleaned all that grout off, blasted uh, the, the clamps and, and gave them a full coat of uh, full repainting. And that's them there in Nina, ready to come back down to Cork. So after the, the repairs were complete, the deck was then removed to Rosseville in Connemara for uh, the application of the paintwork system. Uh, so the first uh, activity in that is, 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 is grit blasting. So here's a photo of a section that's been recently grit blasted to uh, an SA two and a half profile. Um, and then a four coat paintwork system was applied. Uh, so th the remaining three photos there give the, the completed paint system. Um, so the, the, the system comprises a, a zinc rich primer, uh, then two coats of MIO and, and a polyurethane top coat. Um, so this is a test piece that was done prior to any main paintwork uh, taking place. Uh, so you can see this, this is a section of the test piece that's grip blasted to SA two and a half. Then we have our zinc rich primer here on the right. Um, then we have our first coat of MIO. Our second coat of MIO, which is a, it's, it's the same material, but it's a different color, so you can differentiate. And then you have uh, the top, the white top coat of polyurethane. Um, so the, the specification of, of, of the of a suitable paint system was was critical for this for this bridge um, because if you use like there are there are other types of paint systems that have less. Um, less number of coats and a higher higher film thickness. Uh, they wouldn't be suitable here at Daly's Bridge due to the intricate nature of, of the, the members and the lattice work. Uh, the key here is to use a, a system with lots of coats of smaller thickness. So um, that's why we went with the, the four coats, a uh, four coat system. Um, the, overall dry, the overall dry film thickness uh, is, five, is 400 microns. Um, and as you can imagine, the control of the environment uh, in which these sections are painted is critical. So these rooms in Rossville were fully sealed and heaters and dehumidifiers uh, were used throughout to control the temperature and relative humidity. So the lattice towers were fully encapsulated, as you can see here, uh, for grip blasting repairs and repainting on site. Um, so this, this encapsulation protects the, the water course um, from anything entering uh, uh, and, and, and affecting water quality, but it also provides a controlled environment for the application of the paintwork for the reasons that we just, we just pointed out. So within this enclosure, we would have been constantly monitoring uh, the surface temperature to steel work to make sure uh, that we're at a suitable point above the dew point. Uh, and again, dehumidifiers and heaters we use in the enclosure. Uh, so you can see here the other photos are, are of um, uh, following grip blasting. You can see the, the cast steel saddles, um, some repairs that were needed to a few of the members in, in uh, the towers. Uh, and then that's the completed uh, paintwork system and, and the new replacement uh, suspension cables uh, over the tower saddle. So the deck was re-erected uh, on site in early 2020. Uh, so it's essentially the dismantling process in reverse. So we would have craned the sections onto the floating pontoon, floated it back out under, under the cables, uh, and then we would have erected it uh, back up uh, with the block and tackles again uh, from the pontoon into place. Um, key aspect obviously was geometry control. Uh, so there was a lot of tinkering and playing and surveying in order to make sure that we match the exact same profile uh, of the deck uh, and the hangers and the cables and all the components that sat in the exact same place, pointed space as it did when we took it down. So this slide shows some of the southern uh, ramp and key works and foundation works. Uh, so you can see before and after here of the old um, southern ramp versus the, the new southern ramp. And we did some repairs um, to the, the, the ferry steps, the key wall and, and, and the railings. 
you see here the, the new granite sets or the, or the cobbles um, along that quay and the new uh, refurbished and repainted cast iron railings. Um, to the right, you have photos of the, the foundation works. You can see here the doweling and reinforcement uh, for the new plint to receive the new cable system. And then this is the new cable system here. So this slide gives some photos of the approaches and the lighting work uh, as, as we neared completion. Um, so the slide shows that this the plaza area that we were talking about uh, in, the, in the scope of works. Um, so when we're constructing the, the replacement ramp, um, uh, we felt the need to introduce OPS, um, to introduce connectivity uh, for walkers coming along. There's, there's, a, there's a path here uh, leading down to the end of Ferry Walk uh, to give them connectivity to the river, to the ferry steps and, and to the quay. Previously, you had to walk around and down and it's a dead end and you have to come back out again. So it just creates a much more open and, and it creates circulation here uh, in a very interesting part of the bridge. Um, also here I have a, on, on the top right, we have a, a bike ramp that was installed to, to the, the northern approach up the Sunday as well. So as I said before, this is a very steep gradient here, about one in five. Um, we, want to we want to promote uh, sustainable modes, including cycling. Um, so as best we can, we'll help them in terms of uh, very difficult here to push push a bike up so we introduced a, a bike ramp so that you can slot the wheel in and, and then just helps you bring bring the bike up uh, to the top of sunday as well uh, the photos on the bottom are of the phase one of the lighting commissioning and testing out the various colors and settings of the bridge uh, before completion so given the importance of the shake to the social heritage of the bridge uh, and the strong desire to retain that shake um, the dynamic response of the bridge was modeled physically uh, before uh, and after the works uh, and also some analytical models uh, were built to support that. So in terms of the physical measurements uh, a vibration application, which uses a sm smartphone's internal accelerometer, accelerometer was used to measure the response of the bridge, so you can see some output from that up here. Uh, so this essentially is the acceleration response due to a single jump at mid-span uh, on, on the shaky bridge. Uh, and that data then can be um, processed to produce uh, acceleration versus natural frequency plots. Um, so pre-works uh, prior to the repairs, the, the, the natural frequency for the first mode of bending is um, 2.2 hertz. Uh, again, a fairly lively measurement. Uh, anything below 5 hertz is starting to get a bit lively. Um, and then uh, post-works uh, came out at 2.34 hertz, so very, very minor increase in, in the natural frequency of the bridge um, post works. Um, at design stage, we also um, undertook some uh, dynamic modeling using our structural analysis model that we used uh, previously prior to the repair works. So we developed that model further, uh, and you can see on screen there in the middle the first um, three primary modes, so your first torsional mode at 2.2 hertz. Your first vertical mode, which is what we, which is the mode we most feel when we cross the bridge, uh, or when people tend to jump in it, that's the mode they excite. The first vertical mode at 2.3 hertz, and then the first lateral mode at 3.3 hertz. And we also have animation of the shake or, or of, of the dynamic modeling. Uh, this one here is the the first torsional mode from the dynamic analysis, and then the the one below it is the first vertical mode. So we're expecting a, a very marginally increased post-works natural frequency uh, and again, a marginal re reduction in the post-works acceleration. So that was expected given that the nature of the repair works involved uh, repairing damage, essentially increasing member stiffnesses across the bridge. You know, the mass roughly will remain the same. Uh, so the response is very close to the, to the, the pre-works measurements uh, and, and would be equivalent really to what the bridge uh, the response of the bridge uh, when it first opened, uh, or at least before uh, the, the damage occurred. So the bridge was reopened in December 2020 by the Lord Mayor of Cork, Councillor Joe Kavanagh. Uh, as you can see here, they recreated the original opening um, photo nearly 100 years apart. Um, to conclude, I'll finish by showing some photos of the completed scheme. Uh, so you have some aerial shots here.
It's another aerial shot looking back towards Cork City. It's a view of the plaza area to the south. It's a view of the, the lighting scheme taken around Christmas time. Since opening, the, the project has been warmly received by the people of Cork. Uh, a lot of people have visited the bridge uh, to enjoy the surroundings and, of course, to, to test out the shake. Um, the project will ensure the continued safe use of the bridge uh, and has protected an iconic Cork structure for future generations to enjoy. Uh, so that concludes uh, the presentation. Uh, thanks for your attention, and we'll be happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, absolutely excellent. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, it, it really is a, an iconic structure. Um, I live within walking distance of it myself, and um, it's uh, it's a it's a great feature to have in the city, and especially so close to you know Fitzgerald's Park and that. Um, you know, it's it's and it's, it's a beautiful stretch of the river. Um, so. Um, I see Kieran's back on, on, on screen there and Paul. Um, so down at the bottom, folks, is the Q&A button. So if you'd like to, to use that, you can um, submit questions to us. Um, while you're doing that, I would just like to um, welcome, we have a few people uh, who are uh, descendants of Stephen Farrington and James Daly online. So I'd like to... to, to uh, welcome them. Um, I'd like to also have a shout out to Connor Walsh, who is tuning in from Australia. It's kind of five slash six o'clock in the morning there. So uh, that's dedication for you. But he, he grew up in the area and was, uh, like the rest of us, very interested to, to, to see the lecture. Um, so I will kick off there. Um, a question that, that, that popped up there in the chat that I was actually curious about myself was, um, in terms of, of, of repairing the bridge and reusing the as much of the steelwork as possible, but in terms of the, the timber for the decking, was any of that be, was it able to be salvaged? Um, and if not, kind of what was you what was used as an alternative? Yeah, so the, the timber decking was replaced. Um, uh, it, the original, it, actually, the the decking that was on it at the time of inspection wasn't the original decking. It had been oh. replaced during its design life. Um, the decking that was there, it was actually really high density uh, timber, uh, really heavy timber planks. Uh, it made up about half of the weight of the deck was the timber decking. So again, when we came back to the shake, that was a big element of it that the timber decking were replacing it with. We had to nearly match its mass because if we started playing around with the mass too much, the deck would have a very different response. Uh, it would probably get more lively. So um, yeah, we, we replaced it with, with, with timber with more or less the same profile uh, and mass and density as the decking that we took off it. But that decking was not the original decking, I suppose, is, is the important part. Oh, okay. okay. That's fair enough. Um, a quick one there for Kieran. Um, somebody wants to know, uh, would you know if there's any connection between James Daly and the Daly family and an art mal who would have had a, a, a soft drinks company? Well, it was John Daly who had the soft soft drinks company on uh, on Curls Key. I think that's that's could be the reference. I don't know off the top of my head, but my gut is no, because um, I know John da John Daly's mineral works was there from late eighteen hundreds onwards, and then there was a, James Daly had his butter margarine factory late in, late eighteen hundreds onwards. So yeah. Okay. One okay. um, for Michael. Um, um, Joe Ryan would like to know, uh, did the detailed inspection include x-ray surveys for microfractures? X-ray surveys for microfractures? No, we did material hardness, um, chemical composition, weldability. We didn't do micro testing, no. We, and then we took samples for physical load testing of each of those samples. Oh. Uh, but we didn't do um, x-ray, no. Yeah, well, I suppose uh, once it got to the factory, everything was stripped back to, you know, bare materials. So, you know, there would have been no extensive testing on it. Um, uh, another one for you, Michael. Uh, how deep did the dowels extend into the existing foundation anchorages and with what were they anchored? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question because it's it's it, it's it's one of the the key uh, connections in the whole in the whole thing. It's what's holding up the whole bridge. It's connection to the foundation. We're we're very conscious that we were we were removing the cable and replacing that connection. Uh, so that there's there's an array of dowel bars that go up to a meter into the. So it's it's a very long embedment depth, a meter into the the existing concrete. Um, and the system that was used is a, it's a chemically anchored system. Um, so they're, they're chemically anchored dowels. So a resin goes in, bar goes in, then, then it goes off. Um, we also actually did physical testing on some of those dowels. Uh, so we brought them up to a load um, that was about 20% above the ULS load, um, just to have confidence, uh, added confidence in, in, in the connection and to confirm the design resistance could be achieved. Uh, but the concrete was actually good condition. It was up to 40 newtons per millimeter squared, I think is, is from the course we took out of it. So it's, again, the concrete, the seal was a good condition, good quality, equally the concrete actually was was, was similar. Yeah, good quality concrete. Um, um, so Edward Narkey, um, congratulations, we brought in, in, in a very good lecture. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a few words about the, the laser scanning of the, the bridge. Um, I think we can end it, Michael. Uh, the laser scanning? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, we needed we needed uh, accurate um, geomet geometric information in order to prepare models and to do our structural assessment. Uh, equally, the bridge, you know, it's not ac accessible all parts through a traditional survey properly or safely, should we say. Uh, so, you know, in those kinds of scenarios, we've used laser scanning uh, in this type of structure before to good effect. Um, you get you get a really data rich output. You get a point cloud that is everything more or less millimeter perfect. You know it, it spits out millions of points essentially to create the geometry of the structure. Um, that had, they generally modern systems generally have an accuracy of one millimeter at fifty meters. So you know if if, the, if your if, if your instrument's fifty meters away, you'll get an accuracy of one within one millimeter. It's that good, you know. Um, so it's, it's also relatively, you know, it's, it's become relatively inexpensive. It's some surveyors will do it by choice as opposed to other surveying techniques. Um, so it's, 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 it's not at a premium either, you know, so um, it, it also provides a record of the existing structure before we touch it. Uh, so in terms of asset management and, and heritage, uh, you have a perfect 3D representation of what was there before we ever touched it. So it's important from that aspect too. So I'm not sure if that answers the specific question, but it gives a bit more info, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so many questions for you, Michael, in the question. And <laughs> I think people's love for the bridge, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it is one of the most photographed spaces. And if you go down, yeah, I was saying before that the talk uh, went on, if you went, go down there on any evening, the amount of locals out with their camera taking photographs and videos is just amazing. And, and certainly I think the... The amount of questions, um, I mean, I've, I attend many conferences, I've never seen so many questions on a topic. Um, so people's love for the bridge is very much there. Um, I just be, before uh, I get cut off, I just want to say thanks to Dan O'Sullivan, Jerry O'Byrne and Anne Doherty uh, in Cork City Council as well. Uh, just a nod to them with my councillor's hat on. Um, and if I may, Ronan, I, I, there are questions there on the shakiness, Michael. How did you actually make sure that it was going to shake? I have this. I think it actually has the. If there's a better shake on the bridge, you actually can say that. Yeah, well, I, I suppose I couldn't cover it in fantastic detail in the presentation, and it gets fairly technical. But um, yeah, we 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 did physical measurements with accelerometers before we took it down, so we knew the response um, and we knew the natural frequency, and then we did we did modeling. Uh, also before we took it down and, and representative of what we put back up. Um, and so that gave us some confidence that the natural frequency, you know, we do use this term bridges natural frequency in terms of how lively it is. There was no real difference. It was a very slight difference uh, from when before and after essentially. So if you're not changing that much and the acceleration response isn't chase, changing much, then that gives us confidence that what we're putting back up um, shouldn't be any more or less shaky really. Um, but but we're not changing much either. It's important to note that we're putting up the, the structural configuration is the same. Once we keep the mass and stiffness roughly the same, the bridge should react and behave the same. There's no, you, the key is not to go playing with it too much or tweaking it or changing the parameters. Um, do, do, do less and you'll probably get a, you know, 
don't go playing around with it and, you, and, you, and, and what you put up um, should be the same as what you took down. Somebody, some has, uh, leading out from that, some has a tongue in cheek as uh, at what point is the bridge? Can you jump to get maximum shakiness? Uh, Mid span. Mid span. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that either. <laughs> right out to the middle, yeah. I'm going to have to go and test that. Uh, <laughs> right, can I just add, add to that and make a comment and uh, to add to that? Um, normally, structural engineers were, were always trying to tune out the vibrations from any of our structures. And as this is the first uh, project that I've come across. Um, where we are actually tuning the dynamics into the into the structure, which I think is wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it is the shaky bridge, and it is you know um, it it is iconic. So yeah, it would be it would be sad to lose it. Um, um, I suppose, folks. I'm just looking there at the time. We do have a a lot of questions in, but I'm just conscious of time. So I might just um, do one or two more. And um, there are there are quite a few repeats as well. And I think uh, maybe you, you, you've covered some of the stuff, um, you know, some of the questions were asked mid, mid lecture. So I think you've covered some of the stuff. Um, um, I'm just up there now. Um, uh, one here, uh, sorry, I may have missed it, but was it lowered or raised or kept at the same height, which I guess, we have kind of answered Michael that it was the, the bridge deck, is it? Yeah. No, but you put it back to the exact same location, same profile. Say, you know, it was it was uh, lots of surveying going on when it went back up to make sure it met the exact same profile as it came down it. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, just one that occurred to me myself, you, you were talking about leads lowering it down with with block and tackle. Roughly, what kind of weight would have been in a section of bridge deck? You know. Yeah, you're talking. You're talking a couple of ton anyway, at least, or if yeah. not more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you're splitting it up. They're, they're 15 meter sections. Um, you're probably talking three, four ton. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I suppose the question, you know, kind of going forward, uh, what kind of maintenance regime will it need? You know, so that in 100 years time, it's still uh, it's still standing. Yeah, so the bridge is actually already on airspan, which is uh, which is the, the the bridge management system in Ireland. So it, it will receive um, regular inspections at, at intervals not exceeding six years, you know, for the for the remainder, you know. So any 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 damage or, or you know any signs that the paint system might be starting to go in, in time, that will be picked up during those inspections. Um, but generally, once the paint system is 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 maintained, that is maintained properly that will prevent anything like the corrosion damage that was observed from happening again and that that's the key element you know the the paintwork system um the um the kind of uh, historical record that both of you had of the the cost of the bridge i suppose has posed a few questions um uh, i suppose one one being uh, the the uh, 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 a civil engineering project coming in under budget. Um, I was I was good to see. Um, I, like it was was that, like was that the full breakdown or was there a further breakdown of costs? You know, was that that basically the final account and the job? Um, the historic record. Yeah, I, I think that's just Raoul's element of the costs. So that wouldn't have included the approach ramps. Um, you know, the approach from the north and the south, it just included um, the steel work and any components that Raoul provided. And he also did the erection of it. Um, he, he brought a crew over to do the erection of it, but it wouldn't have included any, you know, bulk, you know, main civil works to, to, to build the bridge, excavations, the ramp works, approach works. So it's probably not a, a final account, but it's a good way there, I'd say. Good for, yeah. Maybe you can add maybe 200 pounds, maybe more, <laughs> nothing, nothing major. Um, yeah. But in fair, I mean, Again, I mean, the Daly family and the Farrington family are online this evening. I mean, it's great that, that the legacy continues as well. Like we're, we're also dealing with real people from nearly a hundred years ago that invested a lot of time and effort into creating this, what became a special bridge, I think for all Carconians as time went on. Um, so yeah, maybe the total cost is maybe 900 pounds uh, all in, I'd say, that's my go. I mean, Cheap, really, when you when you when you look at the the benefit that the city has gotten out of it, you know, um, 
you know, very, with good value for money rather than cheap, shall we say. Um, listen, folks, there, there, there is a, a good few more questions, but um, I'm going to offer my apologies to, to those people that I haven't read out your questions. Some of them are repeats, um, but I guess uh, the, the evening's drawing on, so I might, um, I might call a halt to proceedings at this point. Um, we have uh, Lisa Eden online uh, from the Institute of Structural Engineers, so I might invite uh, Lisa to give the, the vote of thanks to our speakers. Thanks very much, Vernon, and um, thank you so much, lads, um, to Karen and to Michael. That was amazing. It was a really, really good talk. And so on behalf of um, the Institution of Structural Engineers Republic of Ireland branch, I'd like to give a, a vote of thanks um, to Karen. Thank you for taking us on a roller coaster of a ride through the history of the Mar Dyke and the site of the Daly, um, Daly's Bridge and its extensive links to Cork's pleasure grounds and amenities, including the gondoliers, the water chutes, etc. And I was just wondering, are we sure the bridge was not originally designed to be shaky? Um, and I can only think that um, all the repair works you've done to the bridge um, and the regeneration that it will bring to the area, that maybe it will inspire the reinst some in in reinstatement of the Mardike um, to, for, to close to form closer to its original intention maybe um so I, I just got that hint from your your talk here and that uh, you know you 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 love the the the, the pictures of the Mardike before and michael um your talk was absolutely fantastic your um laying out your detailed conservation based um and minimum intervention approach was just really good it's really good to hear that um i'm involved in a lot of conservation myself and you just it was meticulous um obviously your your approach to the project um including the level of detail survey the analysis and the bespoke repair details um and it just showed such a deep understanding and 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 the care the care that you applied to this intricate structure um, and there were a couple of points in particular that struck me. The deceptively looking timeline of uh, Rolls Bridges, um, which must have given you such an injection of confidence in taking the projects forward. And those timelines are, are, are great, a great, a great tool. And also the extent um, that you and your team at RPS um, recorded the defects and then interpreted the contributing factors to the damage. And that obviously then in turn led you to evolve the repair solutions um, and a fine set of repair solutions, which is demonstrated by this fantastic reinstatement. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Ronan, if I may, I'd just like to add my own thanks on, on behalf of the Republic of Ireland uh, Regional Group of the Institution of Structural en Engineers. It was absolutely a fascinating Lecture. I said at the start that it was. Um, I was so looking forward to this project already because it was a. It was about history, culture, and a beautiful bridge. And now I say it's. It's actually not just a beautiful bridge. It's about the, the 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 wonder and indeed sometimes magic that is uh, structural and civil engineering. So so thank thank you for that and to Ronan and Engineers Ireland for allowing us to to share this evening and hosting, um, ho hosting the event. And I wish you very well in your in your 80 years and 80 years of, of Engineers Ireland Cork. And it, it goes to show to me that engineers, I think of, of all people, because we involve with real physical things that a lot of what we do can, I think if we do it well enough, ripple and uh, true time, which I think is, is, is great. So we have to be careful what we do because other people are gonna find it in a hundred years time. So with that, Ronan, thank you, I'll pass back. Thank you very much. Um, so gents, Michael and Kieran, thank you very much again for an uh, absolutely fantastic lecture. Um, I think I, unfortunately, one of, uh, while the virtual platform has allowed us to, to reach out to a, an absolutely massive audience, there was over 400 people online this evening. Um, but it, it doesn't allow us to give us, give you the usual vote of thanks, which would be a round of applause. Um, but I think I speak for everybody in saying that uh, we're absolutely delighted with the lecture and really, really enjoyed it. Um, so on that note, folks, I'm going to draw the night to a close. Um, normally at this point, I'd say safe home, but I, I'm guessing many of you already are at home. Um, but either way, um, have a very nice evening and uh, hopefully we'll see you again as another lecture. So good evening.